Hi, all. Nicole here. This podcast is intended to inspire you on your personal spiritual journey to inner peace. I am not a psychologist or a medical doctor and do not offer any professional health or medical advice. This applies to the podcast guests and or co-hosts. If you are suffering from a psychological or medical condition, please seek help from a qualified health professional. You are listening to A Psychic Story, a podcast that shares behind-the-scenes insights of people who lead supernatural lives among the ordinary. And I'm your host, Nicole Bigley. Join me every Wednesday as I dispel the myths behind magic and lore. Welcome to A Psychic Story. Mysticism demystified. Hi, psychic listeners. Welcome to another episode of A Psychic Story. For this episode, I have Reverend Amira Hall on. She is a certified psychic medium, mystic, medical intuitive, quantum energy healer, and has helped thousands of clients solve medical mysteries and gain clarity on their life purpose. She has a master's degree in metaphysics and is a PhD candidate with over two decades of practice and experience in energetic self-healing, manifestation, unexplained phenomena, detoxing, metaphysics, entity removal, and near death. Amir is also an Amazon bestselling author of five books, including Manifesting Miracles 101, Love Up Your Life, and The Essential Guide to Spiritual Awakening. She is the past host of Lessons from the Light Radio and hosts Spiritual Journeys to Egypt. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Nicole. You're just so awesome. Oh, thank you. Same to you. (laughs) Well, thank you. I was listening to some of your previous shows and oh my gosh, you have the most amazing questions. You're so present with your guests and I truly think that is amazing. And that is, I think, basis for manifesting. Yes. Well, I would love to get more into that here. And that's really what we're talking about, right? Is like how your vibes determine your experience and what is that related to manifestation. But you know the drill. What I really love to talk about with the guests before we get into specific topics is how they got started. And you have a very interesting, fascinating journey. So please, wherever you'd like to start, share. Okay. Yeah. You know, I I know a lot of psychics have sort of a, a magic moment when it all began or something that triggered. And for me, I think it was a real ease in. I think it was a matter of the times, you know, the decade. I grew up in the 50s and I went to Catholic school. You know, I was raised in a Catholic family, conservative in fat in Canada. So there was a, there was curiosity. I love to hear the ghost stories, you know, and grandmother and we get together on the weekends. And I was reflecting on this, you know, something I dismissed, but my grandfather always read his tea leaves. Every single night, he would look at his cup. But because Grandpa spoke French, I didn't have a great, strong communication in terms of language with him. But I would always sit and be fascinated that he was reading his tea leaves. And so, you know, talking to angels, talking and seeing dead people, it was a normal course of everyday life for me, only we didn't talk about it. So I kind of I don't know. It was there. It was present. I wasn't scared about it. I, you know, I remember getting a Ouija board at 13 and just I just was glued to it until we had some scary moments, until the truth was so much in our face and some un- undesirable events occurred that I shut it down. And yeah, and I think this is something that you know, it's it's a double-edged sword, isn't it, when we're playing and and curious and opening up into unseen realms. Yes, we're very curious, but the danger zone, and I heard you say it in one of your previous uh, podcasts, that there is the dark and there is the light. And it's a, a very, look, I always, now I tell people, look, and I did all that stuff. I would say, you know, be careful where you play. And if you don't know what you're dabbling with, you could very well be channeling something that's undesirable. And I'm going to give you an example, and and this is sort of a fast forward over 40 years of me and my own discovery and process, but I was in the king's chamber in Egypt, and I've been like 13 times, I just came back, and I was in there, we were meditating inside the king's, the sarcophagus in the king's chamber, and I had this vision of these masters coming down this golden staircase, 
And I was like, oh, wow, it's my birthday. Wow. It's like I couldn't believe the vast, you know, they, they were looking to me like in costumes from different eras, from different times, perhaps different past lives. So they all came down. They descended the staircase. They stood in front of me in one single line. And then the line divided. And, they, and then they turned into identical. They were all carbon copies of each other. And one line said, we are the masters of the light. And the other line said, we're the masters of the dark. Who do you follow? And you know, that moment sticks with me. And it sort of ripples through my timeline in back and looking at my own discovery process going, how did I know I was actually talking to an angel of light? How do I know, you know, that deceased relative is in the light? And so it took me into a deeper understanding and respect and reverence, not only taking care of my own energy and what am I opening up to, but having a reverence to, I don't know. I really don't know at the end of the day. You know, I do my best, but I think understanding and learning how to navigate the unseen world, which is like a crapshoot. <laughs> so I know I'm sort of going down a rabbit hole. It sounds like gobbledygook, but... No, it sounds, it's very clear to me. And um, you're bringing up, this is why I love spirit, because they, there are themes and there's messages that I start to get. And then, uh, you know, we're going to be talking about manifestation for sure and, and your vibe and how that attracts and determines things. But the messages I've been getting lately is we all have this choice. Going back to we're free will beings, we're choice. And that's where and why so many people are becoming reawakened or awakening and going to a different level of consciousness and awareness is because of the choice. And every single day we have the choice, do good or not. And when you talk about like, how do you know? For me, it's like, there's a very big distinction. It's how I feel. And how I feel is going to be in love and light, how I feel and what my intention is, is to connect with light beings and those that are of God source or universal source, whatever you want to call it. It's not religion. It's the spiritual energy and the vibe, right? And so I think that's what you're getting at and why it's so important to just make sure that your intention is connecting with whatever energy you desire to. Well, and that dovetails to, yes, the spiritual awakening. I was looking at it and kind of amused with all of these, you know, <laughs> youngins, I call them, you know, in their 20s and 30s. Go, oh, I had my spiritual awakening and now I know everything and I'm now a spiritual medium or I'm you know, card reader or whatever. And that, I honor that. I, I get it. And the excitement, the the jubilation of, of this awareness is fantastic. The bottom line is we all have to do our work. There is no fast track. There is no switch. Yes, I probably had, I don't know, a dozen spiritual awakenings over the last decades. And so, yeah, I thought I knew so much when I first stepped into this professional game that I'm playing now. I've been doing this work for 24 years. I didn't know Jack. You know, I mean, it's just like, so there's a reverence, but again, back to your vibes. My first big wake up call was when my dad died. And it just so happened I got divorced also at the same time. So talk about dark nights of the soul and big spiritual awakenings. You know, call it a life reset, call it the next chapter, call it my spiritual awake, whatever you want to label it. You know, we want to put these, these markers on things and... Mm -hmm. I guess it was a trigger, you know, a significant trigger of trauma for me to clear out the junk, right? Clear out the cobwebs. But of course, I didn't know that. Of course, I was seeing and crippled by the, the grief and then the loss of my marriage and myself. Well, realizing since dad died, I made every, every decision I ever made was to get approval from my father. But I had no awareness of that. And if you told me that in my 20s and 30s, I'd have thought you're full of crap. And so it was a journey of that's when I was diagnosed with a life-threatening illness. And the doctor told me to go home and prepare my affairs. And I mean, that's crippling. I was in the U.S. My family was in Canada. I had very few friends. So talk about feeling like on an island and lost and traumatized. At the time, my biggest fear was being alone in a foreign country with no family, no real support system. So, you know, I finally found an acupuncturist in San Diego who was from China, and she said to me, well, we don't look at your disease as a label and what you called it. It was chronic fatigue syndrome. And she said, we look at energy, and we look at channels and the flow of energy. And I think that was significant for me because it gave me possibility, some hope, instead of labeling it and staying stuck. And that's when I embarked on meditation and yoga 
and I did some acupuncture. I did chiropractic extensively. I was forced out of the mainstream medical platform. And I think that was another trigger because I started seeing things so differently and open to unorthodox ways. And and this was in the 90s. There was no internet. There was nobody talking about this stuff. Everybody thought I was an absolute weirdo. And secretly going to classes to develop myself. You know, I was tapping into the Jesus realm and the Christ consciousness and working with ascended masters. And that was, again, I think, you know, working with your medium tables, you know, we would do table tipping. And so I explored it all. And I probably opened myself up to some unsavory beings. I remember being freaked out in one of my living room sessions of table tipping where we were, you know, things were getting really weird and people were getting nasty and it, it just felt wrong, right? Well, we were doing, we thought we were tapping into some higher level beings, but I don't know for sure now, you know? And one of my friends that was an, a very famous channeler today, she's doing the circuit. None of the information she ever gave for me was accurate. So I started second guessing this and trying to figure it out. Well, you say something I think is also extremely important. What's popping in in my mind is there's a difference between channeling and connecting and communicating with spirit, whatever you want to call it, whether it's God, whether it's universe and source, whether it's your guides and angels, whether it's something that's not of the light, and then also with your higher self. So I guess my question to you before I kind of weigh in is when you are getting information, how do you distinguish and know it's from yourself and your higher yourself versus it's from an outsider external source? That's a fascinating question. Yeah, that's what they just asked me to ask you. <laughs> because it's taken years and that's exactly what I teach people. And we have to turn down our own energetic system to bypass our own programming. First of all, I would say that I've done like over 20 years of personal development and clearing up and taking responsibility for my own trauma and my own baggage and my own alcoholic family growing up, you know, religious programming, all of my limiting beliefs. I mean, a lot of them. I still have them. I'm human, right? And so working on those limiting beliefs, I think, helped me step beyond my own personal human self. But I teach people how to turn down the lower chakras and coming up into this place that we call the clairvoyant center, the pineal one. And, you know, that's one of my biggest pet peeves is all these people doing classes of let's open up your psychic abilities, your pineal one. You know what? Good luck because you don't just open up one chakra. So the work that I do with people is a full, I would just say it was a wholesome integrative process. We've got to work with our own chakras, clear up our own junk. Then we can, we can learn what our own energy is. When you can define and you can really know your own frequency, you know when something outside of you is coming in. You also have the seniority the spiritual seniority to be able to kick them out and or having the proper tools to move out that invading energy because they do invade. Like I heard one of your interviews where the, at the beginning of her channeling, these baby beings were coming in and haunting her, right? Now she's learned some boundaries, spiritual boundaries. So first, we've got to know our own energy. We've got to be able to set boundaries with our loved ones and our own life. How about eating right? You know, that where's that boundary? How are you managing with your physical body? Then there's the emotional body, the mental body, and then the spirit. Then they're all sort of dovetailing into each other. It's it's not a one or the other. It's a it's a journey, it's a development, it's a an expansion and of awareness and being able to manage our energy centers. And then when we get all of that together, learning how to be present learning how to step out of the body, learning how to come into the body, knowing when that guide that you're channeling in is that guide. Like back 20 years ago, I started channeling Cryon. And then I came across this guy, Lee Lee Carroll, who channels Cryon, who's made it big. But I keep mine to myself. Cryon comes to me too, right? He's my healing master. And whenever I'm in trouble or I'd send them to somebody, man, it's like, boom it dials in, but I know that frequency, just like, you know, if your mom comes up and stands behind, right, you know, oh, that's my mom. And we all have that. We have those senses. But a lot of us have been, I want to say, it's almost like malware that's corrupted our hard drive. 
right? We don't realize this, but from the moment of our birth, we've been programmed and we've got these overlays. I call them patterns. I call them beliefs or pictures. And all those energies is what we've got to sort through and sift through and distill. Because I know that our own unique essence is incredibly powerful. I don't think, you know, we've got, anybody's come near to our superhuman abilities, super psychic abilities. You know, when, when I work with my students and clients, it's like all of a sudden they start discovering parts of themselves that was just completely off their radar. And that can be scary. But if you've got a progression of trusting tools and a system that is grounded in 3D, making us feel safe, and learning how to trust it and build into it, that's where you build in that super psychic muscle, right? And then nobody can take that away from you. Because there are scary moments. Like when I was in the King's Chamber, like, what? Like, is this for, like, I'm not, I know I'm not making this up. This is, I've got way too much experience. And to this day, things that I see and when I connect with ETs or, you know, when this guy came to me, oh, this is, I'm, I'm taking, I'm going, <laughs> we're all over the place, Nicole. This is exactly where, I mean, it's it's interesting when I have interviews with people, the information that comes in, you think as you're saying it, that's not making sense. I'm listening and telling you it's making perfect sense. So keep going. <laughs> okay. Well, recently, like I just moved to Texas and I'm in this little town called Georgetown and there's quite a lot of hauntings here. And so I found this little ad in the local paper and it's a teeny tiny place, right? And so this gal's doing ghost tours. So after seeing the ad a couple of times, I thought, I'm going to reach out to her. You know what? Maybe I could do some channeling or tap into the mystery or what's going on in particular haunted places. So I just wanted to know how she was running her tours and what was the, out of curiosity. So she goes, no, no, no. We just take people on a walking tour and we talk, tell the story. I said, okay. She called me the next day and she goes, you know what? You haven't left my head. I can't get our conversation out. First of all, you caught me off guard. I certainly wasn't expecting that kind of question. But would you be interested in coming to talk to my full moon group? We have this dinner and supper once a month. And so I did. And, and that was before I, that was last October. And so that was fun. But then she got a call from some guy because of her advertising that's feel, hearing and seeing um, beings and hearing voices that keep waking him up. He also moved here from New Jersey in the last year or so. And ever since he moved into this house, which is fairly new, he was being possessed. And of course, going to a traditional therapist, they did think he was crazy. They did have him on some, you know, anti-anxiety and they put him on all that. Then he went to another psychic in Austin and was little or no results. And then she referred him to me. So I start working with this guy because everything is energy. So I said, first of all, you're not able to manage your own energetic field. So although beings are exist everywhere, we've got ghosts everywhere. Some of us are open or there's a tear in our frequency that's allowing this to come in. So we got to close that down. So, you know, it's not something that I regularly look for or like to help somebody with. But within four sessions, he's not hearing the voices anymore. And or when they come, he, he hears them, but he's just... Now, this guy was a financial man <laughs> for hedge funds, right? So he really is thinking he's losing his mind. And yeah, going off the meds that he went on that were making him sick. And, you know, it's probably his next fa phase is stepping into communicating with the with the unseen world. It shows you that it was a matchmaker between like your higher self or guides and angels with hers and then with this gentleman and how like you all, well, you relocated, he relocated and they were allowing you guys to connect that way so that you could help him. Isn't it magical? It's so wonderful. And so, yeah, wondering and looking at all these magical moments, but also being conscious and present and honoring that sign that you get like, gee, I don't know why I'm calling her. And that's not typically my, my shtick, right? You know, and, but I wanted to play and I've had so many years of, of playing in this, this realm. I just thought, well, let's do something different. Let's mix it up here. Boy, did I ever. I do want to talk a little bit about before we get into like your vibe and manifestation about your near death experiences and the things that you learned from that, if you feel comfortable diving into that. And I appreciate that you said, do you feel comfortable if you feel comfortable? Because that's the thing that I held back for 20 years or more 
Uh, I started exploring it delicately, you know, sort of tippy toeing in, but didn't want to, you know, talking with the IONS group and in San Diego, there were near death experiencers. And honestly, I kind of got tired of talking about it. It's like, okay, so that happened. It's like, yeah, divorce happens. And yeah, you, you know, break a leg. And so that happens, but you keep moving on, right? And so I wanted to just get going because at the time, nobody, most people and outside that little group, everybody else thought I was nuts. And that's what I was afraid of is the label. Again, this was in 1998 that it happened. So internet was barely at its infancy. And so there wasn't a support group. There wasn't a community really that I tapped into that I could feel like safe to talk about. For me, it was a journey of discovering what happened because I was stuck in a zone. And this is quite uncommon. I think, I guess this is a second pet peeve I have is all the endears are coming on the scene that all see the light and all see the tunnel and all see Jesus and Joseph and Mary, whoever you want to call on. I didn't. And because it was in Egypt, because it was outside the Valley of the Kings, it was significant, right? Where the burial tombs of all the kings and all the kings and all their horsemen. <laughs> and I was humiliated. I was embarrassed. I was not happy with myself the way this all went down. And so I think I felt embarrassed, yeah, to tell the story. Um, so everybody wants to know, okay, so do you want to know the nitty gritties of what happened or do you want to hear the messages? You had, yes, th the five things you've learned from your near-death experience, yeah. The first thing that I learned was that I was, I stepped into an energy field that was like a moving kaleidoscope of color. And I, I said, where am I? And the voice said to me, this is the fabric of all creation. This is love. And to this day, when I say that and I tap into that, it sends ripples through my body because it's like, how do I understand that? My intellect cannot comprehend it. It's too big. It is. It's, it's like when I remember before I came here on earth, when I was on the other side, I'll just call it the other side, wherever it is, <laughs> the, when I keep saying to people like connect and remember where you came from, like that true love, like that's the essence of who we are as beings. And it's very hard to comprehend, but when you can tap into it as much as possible, who your whole energy, your whole vibration, who you are is really the frequency that we all should be operating at. And, you know, you came in at a different frequency than I did. I had a little bit more life trauma than you. Lucky you, you, you came in with a clearer soul that didn't have to go through all this. But I, I, yeah, and so, but how do we get there? Again, it's not intellectual. It is a frequency. And how do we get out of our intellect, get out of the mind and step into that vibe? I learned that everything is energy and this is what everything is created from this. And then I learned, I actually saw a timeline. So when they talk about life reviews, for me, it was a review of my own life. And it showed me how my emotions on the timeline literally got stuck. And those were what were creating my trauma, my dis-ease, my dysfunction, and how everything, you know, from my marriage to other relationships, how it all fell apart based on emotions. But I saw it from a, a perspective that was so neutral. Like, oh, it's just so matter of fact. Well, of course, it's obvious. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. When you get into your human body, those emotions aren't so obvious. I learned at, in that moment the importance of detoxing. And it's not only detoxing the physical body. Initially, I thought it was detoxing the physical body. Like from alcohol, sugar, processed foods, like that, yeah, is originally. Mm -hmm. And parasites. Quite honestly, I think the thing that we've been through over the last couple of years, a significant impact on that is parasites. And that's something that nobody talks about. I'm talking about a deep cleaning with inside of us, right? Because the body can't hold a high vibration when it's dealing with all this low energy that's sucking our life force, right? So, so it just all of a sudden made sense to me. And from that moment, I've detoxed 30 day detoxes twice a year. And then what I realized is that all those emotions were literally creating everything that I wanted. So, and meditation being the most important, because again, it's part of our detox, right? The mental and the emotional detox is through meditation, clearing the energies that are keeping us stuck and keeping us in pain and dysfunction when, when we come into alignment. I mean, our soul, I like to call it a soul software. 
is so perfectly, you know, planned. And it's so perfect that we can just flow and manifest because because we're here to create. If we're created in the likeness and image of our creator, our mission, our purpose, everybody's looking for their purpose in life. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> It's to create. Well, yeah, no, I would I definitely want to talk about that. But to recap really quickly. So one is the love is the fabric of all creation. We talked about everything is energy. You also said, um, which this is one of my favorite things. I know some people can get annoyed that I repeat this constantly, but we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And also I was in a session the other day with someone and she's like, you say say that a lot and I get it. It was something that I grew up with and my, my grandmother used to always say that. And I said, and, and higher self, her higher self was saying, but she doesn't get it. Like she talks about it, but like explain to her what the difference is. And I'm getting chills about that. And that human experience is what you were talking about it, which is experiencing the emotions, understanding the emotions that you're experiencing and why you're having them clearing and transmuting and detoxing for, and it's not just emotions, right? But that, and that it understands and loops you back to your spiritual self and understanding that higher awareness. And then you talk to about the goal setting and that the software, which is old technology that no longer works, which I want to dive into. And then meditation is key, right? Like those are the five that you learned. And I think all of those are very important and they're steps. And also why I say steps, different stages of where people are at <laughs> in their spiritual growth. And I think we dive or we weave in and out of those steps through our journey. So nobody's further ahead of anybody else. And it's just like, I think, oh, I've got that figured out. Oh, really? Smack. <laughs> you get another level of it, you know, because, you know, one, the other thing I started to learn and discover is that the chakra system being the integral part of our journey in our process, that there's inter there's multiple dimensions of each chakra. So even if you think you've cleaned it out, you we can go deeper down rabbit hole. And multiple more chakras than just the seven. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I'm just talking major seven. I mean, it's just so vast. And that goes back to that moving kaleidoscope of color. That's one metaphor or picture in my mind that is so permanent. Because when, if you imagine those patterns are continually changing, that that's each chakra and our life. It's sort of a great metaphor for our life and the different levels that we get of our understanding and development. And so it's just never ending, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. And you mentioned our purpose. And I, I laugh at this too. And people are like, what is my purpose? That it's creation. But the first time, you know, I had, you know, an existential crisis at one point. I don't remember what age I was. I want to say probably was in my 30s where I was like, what is my purpose? Like, and so what I teach or what I've been taught myself from spirit is that it's going back, like you said, to that love, like love is the fabric of all creation. It's who we are. So if that's the only thing we can understand to tap into when we're here on earth is to channel and be part of that source again, as a human being, remembering that we're spiritual beings, that's number one. But then you said creation, which is manifestation, right? Because then once we're in that frequency, we can channel, we can create that comes from the a certain type of energy and the physical manifestation of it. So can you explain that a little bit? I want to make sure I'm also that that's what your perspective is. Well, and I guess the perspective continually changes too, right? As we have deeper understanding, but the way I see it is I see these three rings at the top of our seventh chakra. And so the divine energy, the cosmic energy, the, the creator energy comes into our physical form, but it's stepped down through what I call these rings. And it steps it down so that we can hold it or integrate it into our physical body. Otherwise, the energy is too intense, too strong. And in fact, I really guide people not to use white light. I know that sounds, you know, blasphemous. No, I love to debunk myths or misconceptions or things like I have my own. I mean, the Christ light isn't even white. It's more of a platinum shiny vibration. But white actually is like hitting the pause button. It's like hitting the psychic pause button. You know, the only time I would use white light is, let's say I drive past a wreck and there's ambulances and stuff. And I know there's somebody injured. I would send and surround them with some white light. What it does is it almost like does a slow motion. So it, it pauses things so people can, you know, organize or get things synchronized. And well, that's why I use it for protection, white light for protection. Well, is that wrong? I'm going to give you a question. I don't know if there's right or wrong, but let's let's process this. 
why do you need to be protected? See, yeah. So I've gone back and forth on the protection thing too. Sometimes, you know, so going back to this is how I was taught, then for a while I didn't, and then I went back to it. Is I always, when I'm channeling or connecting, say, I'm, you know, my intention is 100% divine love, light, and sound, whatever that vibration frequency is. And it's, I'm not setting the intention by saying it because I'm attracting. I'm just doing that because I'm bypassing anything else that that's at least what Michael has been telling me is like, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't harm it. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't help really. So I just do it because it's more habit with light. And it's not really white light as much as I'm just asking people to think through like that overall energy. Cause you were talking about tears and if you're not healed and, or there's tears, then to me, it's like a force field around you while you're in the process of healing. So for me, that's what a protective layer does. Well, when I had my near-death experience, I started to understand the quantum field. I didn't know those words at the time. And it wasn't for some time that I actually read Deepak Chopra's book, or some of his books. And then I started to understand, holy shit, what I'm, <laughs> I'm seeing energy. I'm understanding and reading the quantum field. Energy is always moving. No matter, I mean, it's really an innocent thought to think that you can shield it or stop it. Yeah, I guess mine isn't like just a shield where you can't, it's like hard, energy in, energy out, it's still flowing. But my visualization, that's how I channel and I set it up, is I need something to visualize. I can't visualize energy flowing in and out other than like arrows and other stuff. So for me, that's how I do it. So then it leads to another question or thought is, is it an outside job or an inside job? It's both, I think. I think primarily it's inside job. But for me, I'm looking at, anyway, that's just, I, I love the debate. No, no, no. I'm asking questions. It's not a debate. And, and it's an exploration. And I really, what I've begun to learn is it's as an inside job is up to me to keep my energy field strong and clear. That becomes a robust deflector. Then what we know in science is like attracts like. And so the stronger it is, the more robust it is, the less chance of it being permeated. Yes. Yes. You're right on that. Mm -hmm. So so that's my premise. And then, then of course, yes, I've been under psychic attack. I've, I've had energies that just go whoop and walk you know, knock me out for a couple of days. And, but having the tools to be able to dig it out and sort of bet where the source came from. But a lot of people don't necessarily understand. And I hear what you're saying. Cause like, this is what I got in my, my mind's eye is that the lights like from within and it's going out. So when your energy force or energy as a whole is stronger, it's going out or from in and where it's out and that's creating and it's all flowing. And yes, um, you're able to deflect and, or I want to say for the better part of this conversation, protect, but a lot of people don't know how to do that, but I hear what you're saying. But when you were saying about the light, I just thought that that was interesting because I never thought about it. So you're expanding my awareness too, that that light meaning white light could be a pause button. And when you said pause button, I was thinking the only time I've really been called to call it in is in a moment of, I want to deflect and I want to kind of have this shield around. Well, it's great that you can have that awareness, but a lot of people don't. They leave their body. In fact, a big part of my work is teaching people how to align their spirit with their body. Because as you know, they just get knocked out. You think about your keys, where did I leave them? And you just left your body. You're out looking for your keys. Are they in the closet or are they in my jacket pocket or did I leave them in the car? You just went to all of those places. And so that's how quick our spirit travels. So the work I do is bringing the spirit closer to the body. When we do that, we are grounded and we can be present. We're very conscious. That's another word. I was going to say, so you're talking about consciousness and spirit is the same thing. It's an intentional, it's an awareness. And then you become more aware. Whoa, that wasn't my energy. What did I just see? Who did I just hear? There's all of that going on. And then we can turn it down or turn it up. Or we can say, not today, shop is closed. So, but it is an awareness of the external world that we're in that really is an internal world that we're just, it's just the mind, you know what? Glad you mentioned that. I never thought about it. Like if I, even now, if I'm like, where are my keys? I'm not being present in this moment in this conversation with you. 
And also never really thought that, yes, my consciousness and my awareness level is shifting. And it's really what we would call pay attention. And why intention, intention is so important with that focus because you're calling the energy. And I say calling, but I mean like you're channeling, tapping in (laughs) that energy, that vibe, that presence, which kind of moves us into the manifestation and what you were talking about that, you know, how our vibes determine what we attract. So how are those things out of, you know, what we just, you just shared ways that people can be even more aware of their energy, their vibes, and then what they're attracting and manifesting in their life. Yeah. So I just want to loop back to the white energy because the way I see white, like when I'm working with white, it's a very strong, high vibration. It's a hard to keep that energy going in my body for an extended amount of time. I use gold light because gold is a higher frequency, easier for the body to hold and to keep and to really anchor in and to really extend, practice it, play with them and yourself. It's really a a psychic experiment, I think. And when we do that and open ourselves, well, let me experiment and see, how long can I feel like I can hold that white light versus a gold light? And that gold vibration is such a high frequency, it begins to work like a magnet. Whereas, as you said, the white energy is a deflective one. So again, if, you know, if we're here, I mean, we're going in so intellectual, but if we're here to create, what do we want to create? Are we in this deflective mode or protective mode? Or am I going out to create healing and set up intention to draw things to me in my experience that are wonderful and supportive to my spiritual experience here? Yes. No, I love that you said all that. I'm just like pausing because my guides are going, yes, yes, check. (laughs) You said that the white energy or light is a high, high vibration. And it's hard for us as human beings to stay within that energy over prolonged periods of time. Gold energy is easier in some cases, even though it's still a high vibe and a high energy. It allows it to stay a little bit longer, softer, and that is the color or vibration and frequency when we're looking at manifesting and attracting and how that can come into play. Yes, yes. I I know what I said, but I couldn't have repeated it in such a great way that you did. You're present. You're you're, you're very present. I'm very present. Yes. And I do want to, so I love that we're talking about this because I, speaking of, I, you know, you can't make this stuff up. I had a session with someone and this person in particular this is literally the other day. And she was like, I'm in this manifesting class and these are the things that they teach and all of that. And there's some ways of thinking and thought about you create a vision board. There are some ways of thinking that you have, you're very specific in what you're trying to obtain and attract and all of that. I have my thoughts, but I want to hear from you because we're talking about manifestation. Obviously, energy and our vibe is like, to me, the most important, because if you're not in that mindset, you're not in that energy field, you're, it's hard. But I'd like to hear from you, like, what are some other things that can help with the manifestation and where we're at? You know, I'm going to sound really arrogant and really snobbish. I don't know. I think it's Mickey Mouse, all the 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 uh, vision boards. I know we got to start somewhere. I get that. It's kindergarten for me. Because, yes, I love visual things. And I did make vision boards. And, you know, come to think of it, were they, was I in alignment with those things, those grandiose pictures I had? I did create some tropical experiences of myself in bathtubs in Thailand, but it was 20 years later, you know. If I would have kept that vision board, I moved 15 times since then, you know. So I get all that. We have to start somewhere. Yes, we need to be clear. We need to be specific, but there's also got to be room for the universe to work magic. So again, I come back to coming into alignment. In my mentoring training, when when I work with people, a lot of people come to me and they don't really know what they want. If they really get honest, okay, they could say, yeah, I really want a trip to Hawaii. But is, is that going to make or break or change your life? If it's a car, great. I've done that too with a car. But when we get down to what's really important, a lot of people don't have clarity around that. And so I guess it depends. I do a process of clearing the energy off it because I could want that new car, but I've got resistance. Well, I really don't. I want red, but will I take gold if it shows up? Or I want, I'm trying to ground the energy here to look at this and how I want to frame it. Being specific in terms of clearing my resistance 
on achieving or attracting that desirable item. And I also realize that other people have energy on the items. So we might not attract or, or manifest something because our mom doesn't want us to have that. And our mom doesn't want us to move away overseas because she's going to, you know, miss me. And so unknowingly, there's unconscious energies from other people. So it could be fears. It could even be a past life remembrance that's interfering in you manifesting. So it's a complicated subject again, but I really simplify it by just learning how to clear off the energies and then leave it, let it simmer on the back burner, walk away, stay present. Again, a lot of times people's energy goes into the future of that manifestation. So if that trip for Hawaii is something that you want for October, let's say, then that's great. We've got that on, on the plan, but are you saving the money? Do you have the funds now? What steps do you need to take to get yourself prepared? It's not just putting it there and doing nothing. So how are you personally feeling about it? Is, is there a thought in your head that, oh, that'll never happen, or my family would never let me go, or whatever the rule or the story, or I'm afraid, afraid of flying, you know, and so never admitting it. So there might be that step to get over that fear so that you could then take the step. So it's amazing you mentioned that because I never really thought about maybe the first step being clearing as much as oftentimes when people come to me, they're like, well, I feel like I'm blocking this thing in order to manifest or bring X into existence. And like you said, past lives tends to be a big thing because we may in a past life, our, one of our goals was to live without physical things and, you know, and experience life that way, whether it was intentional or not through poverty or just by decision of, you know, if you were a monk or you decided to live that kind of way of life, a Buddhist life. So there's that. And then that can often conflict with then maybe your goal here is to live in more of a prosperous monetary abundance standpoint with physical things, not because it's deflecting from your spiritual. So there's that. But I love what you were saying about there could be other maybe subconscious things that you don't realize that you're blocking or other people are. So that's like the first thing is definitely clearing. But the other thing kind of going back to the vibes and the manifestation is, you know, spirit was always saying to me, instead of thinking about the what it is that you want, because I always thought it was okay, the job and the title, and then the car or the house or the relationship and whatever. And then I got there and then I was miserable. So I was like, what's going on? I have all these things. And it was the fact they were saying channel and what, it, how do you want to feel? I want to feel unconditional love with something. I want to feel successful. These are the experiences and how my energy is versus the things that define it, which is very different. And then the thing that channeled and came to me in session the other day was oftentimes when we're that prescriptive, like you were saying, with the things that is a form of control. And when we're controlling, it's never in, it's no longer in flow of the universe and it's not for our best and highest good. So then we're blocking our own selves almost in some ways by being too specific <laughs> with what it is. And we think we know, well, what if we don't know? And you made a really important point. I want to feel successful. When you said that, I watched your spirit go into the future. So you're not in the moment. The, the trick is, can you have that feeling and that experience in the moment? Because the feelings you have in the moment are actually what's creating your future. Like I am successful. I am feeling successful or whatever. And then actually trying to channel and feel that. What does that feel like to you? How does that, how did the, how do the molecules in your body when you're in that moment, when you're stepping into that moment or that experience of being successful, the trick is being able to embody it here and now. Yeah. And the reason why I wasn't channeling is, well, because I actually don't care about the feeling successful thing. I was just trying to think of like examples, but yeah. Whether it's success in a relationship, whether it's success in, the, in a career. And those are the most common things, right? Is is bring me some more money and, and honey. <laughs> money and honey, that's what everybody wants. It used to drive me crazy. And we've got to unravel that. And as we step into our spiritual maturity, at a new level of understanding, then we can go, okay, I'm going to take responsibility. I'm going to work on me first. I'm going to shift my vibe. And when you do that, literally, why I say the vision board is almost Mickey Mouse is because your higher self will literally, I was speaking to a client the other day. She was freaked out about jobs and working temp and doing all these crazy jobs. And then after one session, we got clear. She said, Amira, I got, I got a job offer. 
I, I, I had applied for this like six months ago and I completely forgot about it. And she And she, she starts on Monday. The point is she had already done the work, but she got all tangled up in herself. She couldn't allow the universe to deliver it. So again, it's an energetic beingness and a presence. Your vibration is drawing to you that which you've already put in motion and coming into alignment with your heart of hearts of what is that really? Do you really just want to put a ring on your finger or do you want the vibe of a loving, caring relationship? Because you got to be that first. Right. Absolutely. I wholly believe that. And one other kind of point of clarity, when you say put in the work, obviously there's like the clearing, there's the healing, there's all that. But like in this case that you just brought up or example, she had already applied. So it's also like you need to take steps, right? About what it is you're obtaining or trying to get to. So I use the example, if you want love and you're sitting in your sweats and you're not trying and you're not out there meeting people or putting yourself out there, they're not going to necessarily come and knock on the door just knowing that that's the house that you live in and hi, I'm your soulmate. Is that kind of the example of doing the work? Any other kinds of things people can be doing to take action? Well, I think the biggest thing is our baggage. When I'm setting people up, like in the new year, what I do is I go back and look and clear the energy from January through December. I've got, when I do my taxes, I look at all these receipts. I'm like, oh shit, I forgot about that one. I forgot about going to that restaurant. Oh yeah, I went here. We have energy still stuck in our past from just going to dinner with somebody. So we've got to reclaim that energy and release it. Then we have more energy, more of a stronger energy field to focus. Well, maybe I don't want that relationship now. Maybe I'm going to go to the gym. Maybe I am going to lose some weight. Maybe I'm going to just focus on me and and figure out, you know, what is it I really want? So doing the work is like the assessment of things and then the clearing of things. Well, when I say coming into alignment, it's getting real. It's taking stock. And I like to say, hey, let's clear out the closet. If you want a new wardrobe, let's move out the old stuff first. And then really your spirit, your heart will guide you to that next wonderful thing that you're going to create. You know, I've created stuff that I would have never imagined because they weren't in my intellect at the time. But I just opened up the energy field to come into alignment with that next opportunity that blew my mind. I never in a million years thought I'd go to Egypt or Peru. And I just started, I had been doing my work and been listening and I was tuning in and healing myself. And then one step led to another. Well, this has been amazing, Amira. I appreciate it. How can people reach you? You can reach me at my website, amirahall.com, A-M-I-R-A-H-H-A-L-L.com. And I have a free gift of what I call the reset. And it is for people to sort of take an initial inventory of exactly where they're at energetically in their mental, their, their physical, their career, their spiritual, and the fun. You know, let's take a measurement and then we can decide where to go. You get clear what area of your life needs to be spruced up. Well, thank you so much. And yes, if anyone wants to reach her, I will include all this information plus some additional things in the show notes. Thank you again for being on. Thank you for listening to A Psychic Story. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode and join the conversation on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. All episodes are free on your favorite podcast player or at apsychicstory.com. Have a question? Is there a topic you'd like to hear more about? or have a suggestion for a future guest, send an email to contact at a psychic story.com or leave a voicemail message at 1-800-880-1881. We'd love to hear from you and you may even be featured on a future episode. If you're interested in booking a session with me, you can do that directly on the website. And if you want to hear even more content hosted by yours truly, check out my other show, Supernatural Matters. Reminder that you are automatically entered to win either a free 20 minute intuitive or energy healing session with me if you leave five stars along with a positive review. Currently, reviews can be left on Apple, Stitcher, Podchaser, or Castbox podcast players. Don't forget to email contact at a psychicstory.com when you do, because it allows me to get in touch with you if your name is pulled in the drawing. Your name stays in until you win.